they talked about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and, and in the footnote they said, excuse me, that they weren't having a COINTELPRO or counterintelligence program on the Nation of Islam because of what we were doing, but the potential. He said that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad could take us in any direction at will. That's the kind of power that Messenger Elijah Muhammad has. He ain't even on the scene and you here today. That's the kind of power he has. He here in each and every one of us. He here. I mean, that's how you see God. God, he, he, he developed others like he is. I mean, now all of us are God. I mean, we ain't teaching prophet talk. We teaching teachings of God. I mean, that's the kind of people we need in our community. I mean, we need people like Brother Farrakhan. Could you imagine 10,000 Brother Farrakhan's in Philly? Could you imagine 30 million Brother Farrakhan's in America? Huh? Could you imagine the kind of impact we would have on North America? I mean, we would take North America. I mean, North America would belong to us. I mean, it belonged to us already. And we just got to take it. I mean, take it. Stop asking. Take it. It's yours. I mean, stop asking. Take it. I mean, we should take the world because it belongs to us. His lease is up. And let's reclaim our own, and our own is the world. All 196,940,000 square miles of it. Let's take it. So we have a local brother who's artically bad locally. We got a na national oratory or international oratory. We got a local one too. And he's blazing the trail for us as a people. And you're going to hear more of the brother in the very near future. I'd like to bring that brother on. You're going to see the brother. I mean, we're going we to market the brother. Y'all talk about marketing products. Now this is a product that we need to market. Let's bring brother on. Brother James. Assalamu alaikum. In the most holy name of Allah, the all wise, true and living God, who came to us in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom all praise is forever due. We thank Allah eternally for leaving in our midst a divine leader, a divine teacher, and a perfect guide in his Christ, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And we thank Allah and the Messenger for giving us a brother in the 1980s that we did not expect and do not deserve. A brother who serves as a righteous standard bearer, comforter and reminder of us of the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. I speak of brother minister Louis Farrakhan. That's correct. And in those great names, I greet you in the nation's greetings of peace and paradise. I salam alaikum. I would like to thank Brother Farrakhan, all of you, my brothers and sisters. I would like to thank Brother Bobby X, the captain in training of the FOI in Philadelphia. And I would like to thank Sister Edna X, the sister captain in training of the MGT and GCC. 
Brother Gilbert X, and the believers of Muhammad's Temple Number 12 in Philadelphia and all up and down the East Coast for making this day possible in conjunction with our co-sponsors. Excuse me, just one moment. Brother Jerome talked about God and the nature of the black man and that God takes as God of the universe nothing and makes something. He takes a clot, as Brother Kenny Gamble said, and develops it into life. I'm dizzy, brothers and sisters, because my heart beats like a five alarm fire because you look so good. It's all right. Black Philadelphia, you look so good. You look so good downstairs. A thousand strong just downstairs. Packed in all along the wall. You look good up here enduring the heat. Huh? Packed in. So strong to hear God's trumpet. Brother Minister Louis Farrakhan sounding the final call to freedom, justice, and equality for the black man. You look good, brothers and sisters. And we want to say that you have a responsibility along with all that good looking. All brothers and sisters, bear with me. We want to just take an accent on the accomplishments of the Nation of Islam for just one moment. Can I get a handkerchief, brother? We all know that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teachings brought us before planes and boats and trucks and a fish program and airstrips and farms and schools and factories all around the nation and the world. And it took 40 years to do it. But right now, in less than five and a half years, Brother Minister Louis Farrakhan is reestablishing the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in every way. I thank Allah for this man because he represents a big brother to me. He looks just like my daddy. He walks just like my daddy. Okay, come on. And I'm not down in those of you who have a father figure that you love, that you respect, that you look up to. Don't disrespect your physical father, but understand that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is the father of the germ of thought that got you in the place that you're in tonight. <laughs> Muhammad is that man. Elijah Muhammad is that man and his representative. Brother Minister Louis Farrakhan fashioned and shaped by God for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is with us today and he pulled us, some of us momentarily and some of us by the help of Allah permanently, out of the disco. He pulled us up out of the grave. Took you brother from chasing Sister Big Leg. Took you sister from snorting your cocaine and got you in a place now where you're ready to submit your mind to begin productive action. That's not an accident today, black man and woman. Your time has arrived and the trumpet is sounding, being blown by the masterful trumpeter. This nation of Islam, and I love Allah and his messenger for blessing us with Brother Farrakhan is being rebuilt in a time so quick, so astronomically fast, that it spins the head, and I bear witness that my head is spinning. I want to challenge you, brothers and sisters, to support Brother Minister Louis Farrakhan, support his efforts in Black Solidarity Day, support his efforts to reach the world on a satellite broadcast, to reach the world through cable hookups, to bring in the Whiting H&G Fish program again, to support the activities of the Final Call Administration Building, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad National Center, and the Final Call newspaper, among many other programs. I challenge you who keep the dope man in business. 
I challenge you. Without him, there would be no Thunderbird wine. Come on and bring it, black man. Bring it, bring it. I challenge you. Who keep the pimp and the pusher riding Cadillac while you're eating Cadillac dog food. I challenge you who support the systems of a de decadent, debauching, destroyed, depreciating system of white America now to come and support your own. Yes, sir. Brother Farrakhan is your representative. The Nation of Islam is inclusive of all of us. So I want to start by challenging all of us by making my donation to help Brother Louis Farrakhan to the tune of just $100. Equal it, better it, match it, surpass it. We in Philadelphia have got to be able to supply those who stand before us with this. Have you tried living a day in America without this? You can't do it. Who has upstairs or downstairs a hundred dollars or more to support the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Black Solidarity Day, the expenses that we incur in bringing you this great truth? Let's help Brother Farrakhan, wherever we may be, anyone with $100 to match this donation. Anyone, brothers and sisters, anyone. Come on now. Right there, Brother Henry from Washington, D.C. Move right over there and get it, brother. Thank a lot for you, brother. Anyone else? who wants to take $100, which have been devalued to 23 cents a piece, and now constitute where they used to constitute 1 35th of an ounce of gold, now constitute 1 400th. And money is funny now. Who has $100 to help Brother Farrakhan in this work? Who has In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, the One God, to whom all praise is due, the Lord of the Worlds, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever. And in the name of his true servant and last messenger, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, our beloved leader, teacher, and guide, I'm very happy to greet each and every one of you with the greeting words of peace in the Arabic language, Assalamu Alaikum. And to those of you who do not understand the Arabic, it simply means peace be unto you. To Reverend and Congressman Gray, to Brother Jerome, to the Solidarity Day Committee, to the distinguished brothers and sisters who preceded me to this rostrum, to each and every one of you present tonight, those of you who are here in the sanctuary and those who are in the gymnasium, I'm only too sorry that I'm unable to see the beautiful faces of our brothers and sisters downstairs. But I'm honored to be here this evening to share 
Black Solidarity Day with you. I thoroughly enjoyed every speaker that I heard, every word that I heard, and above all, the spirit out of which each speaker spoke. I must say to my dear brother James, I, I thank you for the kind words that you spoke on my behalf. I know that those words are sincere and from your heart, and I deeply appreciate it. But beloved brothers and sisters, I, I don't come to Philadelphia seeking any honor, nor do I come to Philadelphia seeking praise. I'm totally embarrassed, and I know that you mean well, but I want to exalt God and His righteousness and not Brother Farrakhan. Brother Farrakhan is just another atom of life that is blessed to be in this day, in this time, in this space with you. I'm no more than you. In fact, I may be much less than you. I don't like self-exaltation, nor do I like to hear my brothers or sisters exalt me in a way that seems to cheapen others or make others feel that they are not equal to the brother that you are speaking of. I don't want the people who came for solidarity to think that there is no solidarity unless there's solidarity with me. I came to be in solidarity with you and with all those who are present. <laughs> Beloved Muslims, I I must take this opportunity to tell you that one of the worst things that any of us can do is try to drive an individual down the throat of a people. Our people know what to swallow. I want you to bear with me. I'm not going to be before you long because I really don't have the spirit to stand up long. But I want to say a few things tonight, and I cannot even start into what I wanted to say until I make a few corrections. I don't want the people who came for solidarity to think that they're given to Brother Farrakhan. I did not come here to receive a dime from any of the people. If the people are to give, they should give to defray the expense of the Solidarity Day on those who pay to make it successful. Even though if they gave it to me, I would use it for the advancement of black people, nevertheless, I did not come here for that and that injures the spirit of solidarity. It is a contrary to the very spirit that this great um, coming together was all about. So I hope you'll pardon me for taking this time to sort of uh, at least set a record straight before I begin. Secondly, Great men are never great in, of, and by themselves. In fact, greatness does not belong to men. Greatness belongs to God. And when we follow the principles that he used in constructing life, and constructing the universe 
maintaining and perpetuating and evolving the universe. When you build your life on those principles, then you become great, but your greatness is not your personality, your greatness is the principle. And when you are dead and gone and your personality does not anymore exist, the principle yet remains. The sadness among us is that we project personality and very principle when we should be promoting principle and burying our personality for the salvation of principle. For it is only in principle that people can have longevity, perpetuity, and continuity. But personality like mine is a finite thing. I came to birth and I shall die and I shall leave black people here still struggling. But if we can exalt the principle, by which men and nations become free, then my life in serving the principle is a life well lived. But if my life is in service of my own personality, then I am dead before I begin. And you are dead if you are in that kind of service. This is why our movements fall apart. This is why we have no longevity and continuity to our struggle because our struggle is around personality and not around principle. We thank God for Marcus Garvey, for Nat Turner in Denmark, V.C., for Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman and David Walker and Martin Delaney and W.E.B. Du Bois, but these were men and women who gave their life for principle, not for personality. And so, history is kind to them because they did not live for themselves. Elijah Muhammad is not flesh and blood and a personality. Elijah Muhammad will be remembered because of the principles that he established. Jesus Christ is remembered because of principle. And too many Christians and too many Muslims are centered around the personality and fail to look into the personality to find the principle. That's right, dear. And beloved, that's why Muhammad and Jesus and Abraham and all of these men are given to us so that we may study their lives. Their lives are built on eternal truths. And the greater the principle that you give your life to, the longer your name shall be remembered. The earth is here. And the scriptures tell us generations may come. And generations may go, but the earth, it abides forever because it abides in a law. It abides in a principle. And if we abide in that which the earth abides in, then there is no death for us. We have found immortality. And that's why Jesus is said to lead man to eternal life because he leads man to that eternal principle upon which all life is constructed. So from now on, beloved followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I want you to know that you do me a great disservice and you do a great disservice to yourself. Yes, sir. To continue to praise and worship men when you ought to praise and worship Almighty God and recognize that all of us All of us are nothing but servants. And I thank Almighty God for the privilege to be alive to serve in the cause of the redemption of black people in America and throughout the world. And though I share with the dear Reverend 
that we must be concerned for all. I know that in being concerned for self, in the self is the all, for the all came from this self. Now, I'm so happy tonight just to be with you. Philadelphia, you are so beautiful. You are so wonderful. And I am so grateful just to be alive in this time. Why this time, Brother Farrakhan? Because I believe that all time was moving toward this time. When an old idea and an old world of vanity would cease to exist and a new world order would be brought in by simple men and women who would give their lives to principle. <laughs> this world in which we live, a world of sport and play as the Holy Quran describes it. This world and its life is called in the Quran a transitory life. It is not a permanent life. It doesn't mean, beloved, that there is a permanent life for us in the sky. That's not the aim of the Quran. The Quran is pointing to a period of time, an age in which men serve vanities. Men serve the urges of their own flesh. They serve their race, which there's nothing wrong with that. But when you make your race the be-all and the end-all of your service and not the principle upon which the race is established, then the principle dies and the race perishes also. We must lift our sights a little above, no, not a little, a lot above where we were in the 60s. Because this is not the 60s and we cannot repeat the 60s. It is similar but not the same. Please bear with me, beloved. <laughs> what we are saying is that this transitory life is a life where men sought to exalt themselves because of external things, superficial things, material things. This is a carnal-minded world as Paul talks about it in the New Testament. It is not a spiritual-minded world. It is a world where men and women are moved by their urges and the Quran teaches there are men who take their low desires for gods besides Allah. This kind of living and lifestyle has alienated us from God and alienated us from one another because we're all competing, competing to be seen, competing to be heard. Did you see me last night on television? Wasn't that terrible? Was I bad? Competing to see which one of us can move the crowd the most in the shortest amount of time and let them talk about us when Solidarity Day is over. Beloved, that's vanity. That's not solidarity. That's cheap. That's so small. It is undeserving of divine comment. It's part of the transitory life, a life of sport and a life of play. We're playing games, maybe. I don't come to play any games. I believe that all the game playing is over. And those who seek to play games with black people's lives and destiny will be destroyed in the movement of black people toward their destiny. Nothing will stop the march of black people toward our destiny, beloved. Everything that is going on today is going according to plan. Do not get excited. Do not be upset because the government is moving to kill black people. That's written in both books. Don't get upset because a 
recalcitrance is seen in the government and that a very conservative right-wing mentality is seen in circles where you used to see apparent make-believe compassion. Don't get excited over this, for it is written in the book. And if it is written, then the wise prophets were seeing by God's permission, they saw us go through it, and they saw us coming out on the other end of it. And they wrote a plan by which we could get through it. But those who do not hope in the plan of salvation given by Almighty God in the Bible and in the Quran and in nature, then naturally we become hopeless. All is lost. Oh, what we gonna do? I'm so glad tonight I'm in Bright Hope Baptist Church. I'm honored to be here because I like Brother Lukman. I'm getting sick of labels that are superficial that divide us and make us all think we are different. I see us like children promoting the personalities of prophets. Moses is my man. Jesus is my man. Muhammad is my man. Elijah is my man. Malcolm is my man. So-and-so is my man. So-and-so is my man. And nigga, if you ain't with my man, you ain't where it's at. And the same principle that Moses' life was built upon. Jesus had a greater extension of it. Muhammad had a greater extension of it. And we're here at the culmination of it all. Their life is extended principle. Oh, beloved, I too see and I saw when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad departed from us as a lover of his and a, that man taught me what I know. That man gave me an opportunity to serve black people in a way that I never dreamed possible. The man is my mentor, and I truly, truly love him. But when he departed from us, the shock of not being able to go see Muhammad, not being able to call him up on the telephone and hear a word of counsel from him. Now I know how the Garveyites felt when Marcus Garvey was deported. That's right. I know how the followers of Malcolm felt when he was gunned down. I know how the followers of W.E.B. Du Bois felt when Du Bois was no longer with us. I know how those of us who love and honor the memory of Noble Jew Ali felt when Noble Jew Ali was killed. But they killed the flesh or the flesh and blood died or the flesh and blood departed. But can you kill the idea? Come on! Come on! Can you kill the principle? No, you can't? No, are you sure about that? Well, all right then. If you are sure that we cannot kill the principle that made Nat Turner, Nat Turner, and Denmark Vesey, Denmark Vesey, and Gabriel Prosser, Gabriel Prosser. Oh, no. If you cannot kill the principle that made Marcus Garvey and Noble Jew Ali and Elijah Muhammad and Jesus and Moses and Prophet Muhammad and Abraham and all the great men in between, then I say to you that those men are not dead. They are alive today in you and in me.
Yes. So I don't have to look back for the great Denmark Vesey. He's here. <laughs> I don't have to look back for Marcus Garvey. He's here tonight. Nova Drew Ali is here. Elijah Muhammad is here. Malcolm is here. They're all here. But they are here in you and in me if we would live according to the principle and not become a slave to the personality. This is why Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they don't tell us where Muhammad, you know, a, a grave site, they don't like that. Because Muhammad didn't like men coming to his grave, pouring over his grave as though he's there. <laughs> well, Muhammad is here. <laughs> Have you ever been to a funeral parlor recently? Check out the dead. Whoever you thought that was, that's not him. That's not her. The him and the her that you love, that's gone. What you see is the remains, and we put the remains back in the earth. So you don't need to go to the grave of your great ones. Go to the principles of life of your great ones and let them live again in you and in me. There are too many people talking Jesus Christ and too few people living him. There are too many men talking Muhammad, but there are not too many Muhammads around. There are too many men talking Elijah, but there are very few living Elijah. There are too many praising and talking Malcolm, but too few living. So tonight, tonight, beloved, I wanted to talk tonight about something that I believe is important to produce solidarity. I would like to talk for a few minutes on sacrifice. Dear Brother Lukman, who saw his wife give birth to new life and was there to see this new life come to being. As I looked in his eyes as he spoke, I saw that that experience registered deeply in my brother. And it will transform him, such an experience. He saw a woman who loved him enough to receive him. To receive him as a person to receive him and fall in love with him because of the characteristics of God that were manifest in him. But then she loved him so much, she wanted to receive the essence of him. That she could, out of her love, grow him again. Now, She had an egg to receive the sperm. And even though the sperm is different from the egg, by nature, they are made for each other. And even though the sperm <coughs> doesn't appear to have intelligence, it seems to know what it wants and how to go about getting it. Everybody all right? Yes, sir. Come on, beloved, come on. Now, in the darkness of the womb, the sperm found the egg. And the sperm which brother sacrificed, he had to give up the essence of his own life in order to see life going on in another generation. That's a profound lesson. Yes, oh, vain 
men and women who live for today and see our children and not prepare for them. When we love truly, we prepare for tomorrow while we work today. And in order for Brother Lukman to ensure tomorrow, his place in tomorrow, he had to sacrifice the essence of his life today. That sperm may lose itself in the egg and the egg may lose itself in the sperm to create a new self. And that new self was a cell of life having everything within it and it started revolving in the darkness of the womb even as the planet begins or moves. Marvelous, profound lessons of sacrifice. The sperm had to sacrifice its identity. I'm a sperm. I like being a sperm. I'm a teacher of sperm supremacy. <laughs> now I'm challenged by an egg. <laughs> How ridiculous, isn't it? When they meet each other, there is no more sperm, no more egg, a cell. What is that telling us? That, beloved, we are constantly being renewed. And we cannot be what we were. We must constantly evolve toward our perfection. And since the sperm cannot remain a sperm and then grow into the magnificent human being until the sperm is willing to give up its identity as a sperm to become a cell. As a lesson, a profound lesson of sacrifice. Yes, now notice the sperm becomes a clot. The cell rather becomes a clot. So the cell multiplies, takes on a different form. See it? The old form subsumed into the new form. The old form evolves into a new form. And the new form is, is beautiful, but yet not complete. So it gives way to another form. But notice, notice, there is no repudiation of the old form. There's just outgrowth from it, thanks for it, but can't stay here. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> Beloved, we must continue to grow, but don't hate the path that God brings you along to evolve you from. Thank God for whatever your life is, but know that you can't stay there. Because life didn't make us to stay where we are. Life made us to evolve toward God. You got a few minutes? <laughs> now the, the clot becomes an embryo. The embryo becomes the fetus. And then the woman lays down and experiences the pain of death to bring forth new life. You witnessed, beloved Brother Lukman, your wife dying for you last night at 3.47 a.m. He witnessed a woman showing what love will lead us to. Love will lead you to give up your life to see something greater come into existence. I'm talking on sacrifice tonight. Because I think if we love black people enough and love the principle of life enough, we're going to have to make a sacrifice of yesterday's old tired ideas and thoughts, tired form 
and evolve into something more suitable for the requirement of the time. Hear me, beloved. I won't be long. Take your time, beloved. And so, out of that lesson that this woman in great pain, wasn't it? Great pain. And last night about that same hour, just a few hours ahead, my daughter gave birth to my 10th grandchild. <laughs> and she called her father from the recovery room and said, Daddy, is here as a boy. She was explaining to her mother and me about the pain and whatnot and whatnot. She had it naturally. And she was so joyous. It was hard going through it, but so joyous on the other side of it, looking at this new life. My Christian brothers and sisters have a song, you know, that I, sometimes I sit and wonder how I got over. <laughs> they don't understand the method by which they made it over, but they got over. And they have to sit and wonder about it because it's so marvelous how it got over. Now, by the same token, if we sing the song, I wonder how I got over, it's telling us that even though the hour is dark, there is a method, there is a way to get over. And you may not comprehend all of the wisdom of that way, but if you just walk in a path of rectitude by your walking correctly, when you get on the other side, it's then that they say you'll understand it better. Not now, but by and by. There's, there's wisdom in all of that. Wait, wait. I'm going to try and run a little fast now because I know you are tired. You've been here several hours. And I, I'm just so grateful to be here with you. But I, I, I would hope that Almighty God would bless me tonight with this subject of sacrifice. And so let me run right to it. Now I'm in the church tonight. So I'm going to use the Bible as well as the Quran. And I'm going to use both books because I believe in both books. I hate this division among us. I see it as unnecessary. And it's a product of our ignorance. When we become wiser, we recognize if there is but one God and he is not the author of confusion, then there has to be a way that all of the branches can be brought together and recognize that they are part of one tree with one dynamic root. All right. Now, Paul, now some of you who don't dig Paul, but now let's not get off into personality. <laughs> let's deal with some principles. Paul is talking to the Romans. And that's very interesting. Because if we look back in time to ancient Rome and look at the principles upon which Roman life was built, then we can say we live in a modern Rome today. Yes, sir. Because the same principle of sport and play that Rome was built up off of, America, uh, unfortunately, is built up off those same principles of sport and play, and it is a part of the transitory life of this world that must give way to a more serious life and a much more serious lifestyle. Paul is talking to the Romans. Now, hear his words. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, 
that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now that's, oh man, look, I thought you was going to get in something for our kind. You going to lay this Bible on me. Wait a minute. I don't want you to get carried away now because I say Bible or Paul. Remember, we're not dealing with labels and personalities. We're dealing with principle tonight. Paul is telling some people. Now, let's see whether he's telling them right. He says, brethren, I'm beseeching you. He's calling his brethren, the people of the faith. He's saying, look, brothers and sisters who have given yourself to Roman conduct, Roman life, Roman norms, Roman folkways, Roman mores, and have become a Roman in spirit. I'm asking you, brethren, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Paul is saying, we appreciate your tithes, but we don't just want your 10%. We appreciate the fact that you would give a dollar to this or a dollar to that. I'm sure the brother who's running for mayor appreciates people who give dollars to his campaign. It's necessary. But today, That's not good enough. Now listen to me good now, brother and sister. See, a lot of rich people hide behind money. There's a lot of hypocrisy in the dollar. Listen to what I'm saying. Come on, brother. I'm going to give you some money. I'm going to give you some money for your campaign. But I ain't, you know, I'm not coming out. You know what I mean? I can't. <laughs> you though brother I'm with you see I'm trying to give you some money so that if you elected mayor you remember me but I don't want Rizzo to see me coming out for you in case he's elected mayor I can get something there too so I am not giving a damn thing pardon my expression I'm not giving anything I'm serving vanity I'm serving myself but I'm jiving you and making you believe I'm with you and you jiving me making me think that you think I'm with you <laughs> the whole bunch of hypocrites together right see Roman life is hip hypocritical life and black folk in America white folk lifestyle is hypocritical and the life that they cause us to live is a hypocritical lifestyle. You smile when you don't mean it. Yeah. You say peace and you mean war. You say love and you mean hate. But you mask all your hypocrisy behind noble terms. That's what the American government is built on. That's the kind of law that came out of Philadelphia. It was a hypocritical law. It was a law that was for some but not for others. That's not true law. When God make a law, he make it for all. And he don't care whether you white, black, rich, or poor. The law is for everybody. White folk didn't make no law for everybody. There was hypocrisy in Philadelphia. And the same hypocrisy exists right now in this so-called brotherly love. So we can't, no, 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 no applause. We can't mask this hypocrisy behind noble names of solidarity. Go ahead. I'm with you. And then tonight, when you're alone with your other rebels, you conceive something else. Or your real agenda comes out. You are here because you want solidarity, 
But you know that in order for us to get solidarity, we've got to remove from our hearts hypocrisy. And when we say we are with something, we must not only present our money, but we have to present our bodies as a reasonable service and a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Now this Paul was something. This Paul was saying, uh-uh, I want more than just your money. I want more than your fine words of praise. I want you to give up your body as a sacrifice. Now, man, what are you talking about? Now, you, can you bear with me a few minutes? Come on, man. Now, you know, the Quran teaches the same principle. Listen to this. In the ninth chapter of the Quran, in the 111th verse, it reads, Surely Allah has bought from the believers their persons and their property. Now this is the Quran. Allah has bought from the believers their what? Their persons and their property. When Brother Lukman opened up, he said that Muhammad was the slave servant of Allah. He's a slave, but he's not a slave by force. He's a slave by his own choice. He chooses to serve God. He chooses to obey God. He chooses to surrender himself totally to God because he recognizes that God is the owner of his person. And all that he has, God is the owner of that also. So let me give what I have in service to Almighty God. So Allah says, he bought from the believers their person and their property. Theirs in return is the God. He's making a bargain with you. Will you choose to give me what I already own? <laughs> And look at what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you in return the garden. Now the word garden, you know, it just means, uh, beloved, you know, not just God is going to give you a garden. Now in Philadelphia, a garden is beautiful. But we live in concrete. We hardly see a garden. But if you can picture a garden and picture Saudi Arabia, nothing but sand and every now and then a little water. And you told those people that they would get a garden. I mean, they understood that was something out of sight in Saudi Arabia. A garden wherein rivers flow, trees of every kind growing up, bearing plenteous fruit, and youths never altering in age, and men and women reclining on raised couches. This is the Quran's description of the paradise. But look, beloved, it don't, you can do that right here. That's right. You can get you a fine couch and recline on it. Learn how to eat to live and you won't alter too much in age. Get you some trees that bear fruit and you'll have you a garden. But that's not what it's talking about. Beloved, the garden here is actually a fertile, delightful spot where things have sufficient water, sunlight to grow to their fullest potential. So in exchange for you giving me your life and your wealth and your property, Allah says, I'm going to give you a garden. And the garden is, I'm going to actually allow you to grow to your fullest potential. And your fullest potential is not human. Your fullest potential is divine. Now listen to me carefully. You are born to be a God. Come on! 
Yes, yes. Now, listen carefully, Muslims. This is why Allah blesses us to wear his attributes and characteristics because by nature you are born with the capacity to reflect the divine being on the earthly plane of your existence. Now if you and I surrender to Almighty God, he says, I will feed you. I will put rivers of water under your gifts and your talents and your dormant qualities and abilities and I will cause you to grow and grow and grow and grow until you become a perfect expression on your level, on your earthly level of my divinity. Now, this is what you get just for being a servant of mine. Teach me, love me, now you said earlier, Brother James, or someone said, no, brother, brother uh, Jerome, think of what America would be like or someone would be like with 10,000 fire come. Stop it. Forget about 10,000 fire cons. In but one. Don't try to make men in my image. You insult God by so doing because that which makes me different from you is the unique gift of God so to dare to impose what I am on somebody else is to deny the uniqueness of them we don't want 10,000 Farrakhan you hear what I'm saying we want not 10,000, we want humanity, black humanity, to recognize its divinity and make the sacrifice of those things that are deterring us from our complete evolution into the fullest development of our own divine potential. Do you hear? Let, let me move on. Now, I'm going to be very brief, but... No, I'm not going to take too much time. <laughs> now listen. If you go back into Bible and Quran, and we're just dealing with principle now, not personality. See? Cain and Abel, the children of uh, Adam, were asked to make an offering. Both men made an offering. One man made an offering from the ground and another made an offering of life. And God accepted Abel's offering. Cain didn't understand the principle. And you know, beloved, when you see people evolving and their own gifts of God being made manifest, it becomes a trial on you. Please listen, please listen. You watch somebody evolving. They don't evolve in a vacuum. They evolve because they're working along certain lines of principle that bring success. You fail in your endeavor because you are not working with these principles. Then you sit around and say, see that nigga? That nigga ain't this. And that nigga ain't that. Hold it. Look at yourself. The same potential that is in me may be greater in you. The question is, what are you giving your life to in terms of principle? What are the principles that govern your life activity? And if the principles that govern your life activity are against the evolutionary forces of your own development, then you will not evolve. You will see others evolving and you'll say, God is unjust. No, you are unjust to yourself. Now listen, hold on. Everybody all right? Now, this sacrifice, listen carefully, you see it with Abraham. 
Abraham couldn't have a child, according to the book. Sarah was old and was barren. So Abraham, who's called the father of the righteous. And if you were a contemporary of Abraham, I wonder what you would think of him. See, it's easy to look back on men in history from your vantage point and say, oh, he was a good man. But sometimes it's very difficult when you're walking with greatness to understand goodness in greatness when it far exceeds your ability to perceive the principles upon which goodness functions. See, goodness don't function on your madness, your little cheap, mundane, baby idea of right and wrong. Good functions on principles that reach deep into the core of human nature. Listen good now, into the universe and its order. And when God wants to make a sign of something today that will last into the future, he will make a man's life serve not just today, but serve tomorrow. And there are things in his life that are not for today, but are for tomorrow because that man is to be an example in his life for all circumstances of life. Here, here now, please. Everybody all right? Okay, now look at Abraham. Check him out. He's the father of the righteous. He goes into Hagar. There's an agreement, evidently, Sarah. says it's, it's cool. And she produces a child. Well, the Bible calls him Isaac, the Quran calls him Ishmael. We're not going to deal in names, we're going to deal in principle. Okay. Now, Sarah then becomes pregnant. She produces a child, and now she seems a little inflamed over the fact that Hagar is there in the house with Abraham. She says to Abraham, hey, this has gone far enough. Get her out of here with her child. Now, if you were back there looking at Abraham, you'd have said, stand up, Abraham. Tell Sarah, look, girl, you agreed to this, and the woman's going to stay because that's my baby. Abraham says, hey, God, you got to get out in the wilderness. <laughs> Now, if you were a contemporary of Abraham, how would you judge his behavior? I can see your wagging tongues right now. And Abraham says he's a prophet of God. The hell he is. Look at him. He let that woman, Sarah, tell him, put that poor woman out in the wilderness with her baby. You know that that man is supposed to take care of his children. Look at how he got that woman out there running between them hills. I'm not making no mockery. I'm just showing you how you can look back on, on great men and say, oh, he was a great man, but you ignore the principles that, that governed his life. And all you can say is Abraham was great, but what were the principles that made him great? Because as brother said, Abraham was a prototype of a greater man coming down the road. So if you see the principles that built up Abraham's life, then when you recognize those principles working in the life of the contemporary man, you won't be so critical and crazy. Well, it's all right. It's, listen, you're not up here. It's hot up here. You know, and there's not a good flow of air, so you notice how Sister Sonia had to take water because you could see her throat restricted. And I feel it on mine, but Allah's going to bless me to get through this message, and you're going to be all right. Just be a little cool for a few minutes. And if I pass out, just put some water on me, and I'll come back and finish it up. <clears throat> all right. <laughs> you all right now? Everybody all right? Now look, Hagar's out in the wilderness. That's a woman running in the wilderness. I don't have time to run this all the way through scripture. But beloved, there's a reason why Abraham's wife was put out in the wilderness. 
without the maintenance of Abraham, without the support of Abraham, without the comfort of Abraham, without the husbanding care of Abraham, that woman was in the wilderness with a baby. And you'll find that woman running all the way through the scripture till you get to the book of Revelations. There is a woman standing in front of the dragon with a baby in her belly to be delivered. And where is her husband? Where's the father? Where's the protector? Where's the maintainer? Where's the provider? Where's the support? The woman is all alone. And a dragon wants to devour her child as soon as it is born because the child is destined to rule the nations with a rod of iron. So the woman has to take on wings and fly into the wilderness with her child. What does that mean? It's a principle. When God wants to make a people for destiny, he strips them of the normal means of support. Everybody all right? <laughs> he strips them of that which they are accustomed to relying upon so that they can realize that there is a greater power than the power of the one whom they're relying on. So they grow above reliance on that material power in that material person. They take wings and recognize there is a superior power that's out here in the wilderness with me, even though my supporter is not here, my maintainer is not here, but God is always present. And that kind of spirit in a woman produces a very uniquely different kind of child. And it's not an accident, black woman, that you are having your babies today in a wilderness without the support of a man, without maintenance, without husbanding, without care, without love, without providence. But it is because God wants you to produce a special kind of child. And you have produced that kind of child. But I'll get to that later on. We're talking about sacrifice. Abraham has the boy, he grows up with the boy, gets real close to the boy and loves the boy, and then God says, all right, Abraham, take the boy up on the mountain and sacrifice him for me. When you read the Bible, you say, my God, what kind of a God is this that would ask a man to take his own son up on a mountain and drive a dagger into his heart to prove his love for God. Abraham is getting ready to take the boy up on the mountain. Islamic traditions say that Ishmael, the boy of sacrifice, in the Bible is Isaac, but we're just going to deal with the principle. The boy of sacrifice is met by Satan. And Satan says to him, boy, I don't think you ought to go up on that mountain with your father. What did your father tell you he was going to sacrifice? He said, well, he told me he was going to sacrifice a lamb. He said, mm -hmm. Satan always want to blow your cover, you know. <laughs> Satan said, it ain't no lamb, boy. It's you. Now look at, Ab look at the boy of Abraham. Abraham's child could have said, what? My father gonna do that? God gonna ask my father to do that to me? Later for my father, later for God, later for this whole thing. I'm through. I'm getting the hell on out of here. But no, that boy didn't talk like that. Not only was the father asked to sacrifice the boy, but when the boy came into the knowledge of what the father was about to do, the boy said, listen to his words, if it pleases God, to have my father sacrifice my life, it pleases me also. And he never let his father know that he understood. He went up on the mountain with his daddy. And when they got to the top of the mountain, he asked his father, Father, where's the lamb? 
father said, son, the lamb is you. The boy laid himself down on the altar. And as the father raised the dagger, God stayed his hand and said, it's all right, Abe. I know now that you love me more than anything else. So I make a covenant with you this day. Why? Because you were willing to sacrifice. Now I see you are ready for what you should receive because you're willing to give up everything to receive what I want to give you. Now, Abraham, I make a covenant with you and your son. Look at this now. That all these lands, look at them as far as your eye can see, Abraham, it's going to be yours. But I had to know, Abraham, that you love me more than your son, more than life. That you would obey me above all. Now look, beloved, you and I are never tested in a sacrifice by what you don't like. You are tested by what you love. And if God asks you to give up what you love for something greater, then let's see what kind of strength we have to make that determination. And if you look at that going all the way through, it comes to the apex of all biblical scripture, which is Jesus Christ. Here's a man born of a woman, had to get out of Palestine when he was a little boy, growing up in Egypt, coming back among the Jews. The Jews hated him, scorned him, rebuked him. He grew up in the temple, but he had a greater knowledge than the scholars, the, 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 the scribes, the Pharisees. And when he started to expose a greater knowledge, the jealousy, the envy, begin to creep into the hearts of the religious men for this man Jesus. But that jealousy and that envy would lead them to seek his life even though they knew he was a good man. Hear me out, there are principles here. These same principles, every black leader that has ever stood up among us that was worth anything has followed these principles. You've got to be evil spoken of in order to be a true servant of our people. Everybody's not going to love you. If you want to be loved by everybody, then forget it. Don't try to serve black people. Because if you want to free black people, then you're going to anger the people that enslave us. Did you hear me? If you want to free black people from drugs, then the dope merchant is going to hate you. The exploiters and bloodsuckers of our people are going to hate those who sincerely want to see our people liberated. So if you want to be loved by everybody, then you continue to be the fool, the nigger, the dope, the stupid one. Because no one will love you, and you will claim to love everyone. But the proof of the matter is, the truth of the matter is, you don't love anyone, not even yourself. Because if you loved yourself, you would be willing to sacrifice yourself to see the future of our people secure. <laughs> now Jesus knew all the time he had to go through this. He had some trifling disciples they didn't understand youth they didn't understand life they didn't understand faith but they followed the master but they followed him really with lack of faith lack of vision I'm coming to something Jesus kept telling them I'm going to have to leave you I'm going to have to leave you Marcus Garvey kept telling his followers one day I'll have to leave you Noble Drew Ali said, one day I'll have to leave you. Malcolm knew one day he had to leave. Elijah Muhammad kept telling us, I'm going away, brothers and sisters. Why was he telling us this? He was preparing us for the inevitable. 
that when the person and the personality is no longer there, will you at least stay with the principle? Will you uphold the principle? Now, Jesus went to the cross. Is that right? See this cross here? And I'm very pleased to be here tonight with this cross behind my head. You know why? Because I think for the first time in my life, I truly understand, at least better than I did before, the meaning of this symbol. This symbol represents death. But it represents a special kind of death. A death that leads to a greater life. Listen now. When I see my Christian brother with the cross on his neck, I don't look at him today with scorn as I looked at him in my lack of true understanding or developing, evolving understanding. But I look at him now and I say, oh yes, brother. You got it on your neck, but I'm living it. I know what that symbol is. I got to teach on it. I got to teach on it. Marcus Garvey knew what this was because he was crucified for you and me. Noble Jew Ali knew what this symbol was because he was crucified for you and me. Martin Luther King knew what this symbol was because he was crucified for you and me. Don't tell me that Elijah Muhammad didn't know what the symbol was. Because he was hated, scorned, evil spoken of, spat upon. And he stood there taking it as though he had no means of defending himself. And I say this to you, beloved. If you want to help black people, you'll get acquainted with this symbol. There's no one among you that truly say you want to help black people. If you say you love black people, and I'm sure you do, the depth and the intensity of your love will be tested by this symbol. Look what Jesus said. The man said, Lord, how can I attain the kingdom of heaven? He said, do the law of Moses. He said, well, I'm already doing that. I'm a very law-abiding man. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't fornicate. I don't commit adultery. I keep the Sabbath. I don't covet my neighbor's wife or anything else. And Jesus said, boy, you do well. He said, now I want to ask you to do something else. I want, to, I want you to go and take your goods. And listen to this, now take your goods. Now you're getting into my pocket. I took mighty no. What you said, Jesus? I said, go take your goods. Sell them and give your money to the poor. Can you see him drawing up? <laughs> any resemblance to any persons in this audience is not a coincidence, brother and sister. <laughs> Look here now. Boy, start drawing up. Jesus said, he didn't stop there. That was bad enough, but Jesus didn't stop. He said, deny yourself. Deny yourself. Deny your vanities. Deny your urges. Deny these things that make us want to be on top of our brother and not walk with our brother. Deny yourself. Then he said, you got to go one better than that. After you deny yourself, you must pick up your cross. Don't just pick it up. Uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. I know you got strength to pick it up, but I don't want you to pick it up. I want you to carry it now and follow me. What are you saying, Jesus? I want you to deny yourself. And I want you to have this same mind in you that I have in me. 
that I am willing to suffer. I am willing to go to jail. I'm willing to be rebuked and scorned and evil spoken of by men. And without a vindictive spirit, because you are a redeemer of your people, I want you then to be willing to go to your death to see your people free. And that man said, well, later, Jesus. I'll catch you around. <laughs> and most of you, most of us, we got that same spirit. Later, Jesus. I see you around, yeah? Nice knowing you. <laughs> some man, ain't he? Some man. <laughs> the BS. You want freedom? You don't want to pay the price. You want heaven? You don't want to die. You want the crown? But you're scared of the cross. You want up? But you don't want to go down first. Why? Because you don't understand the principles that life is built up on. And if you understood the principles that life is built upon, the first and the greatest principle of all is sacrifice. Giving up something of yourself to achieve something greater. Now I can conclude. Paul says, So be not conformed to the world. Conformed. Don't yield. Give of yourself to the world that you become the world in nature, character, and in spirit. Some scholars say, don't be conformed to this age. Look at the age in which we live. It is a time of wickedness and filth. Degeneracy, debauchery, adultery, fornication, freakishness, pleasure-seeking, dope addicts. Who wants solidarity? Yeah, I want it. Long as it don't make no demand on me. I'm, I'm going down and hear them niggas rap. Tell me that Farcon can rap, man. I want to check his rap out. But that's as far as I'm going. Don't make no demand on me now. You understand that? Now, nigga, you and I gonna get along all right. Just don't make no demand on me. Soon as you finish, I got a party to go to. And I wish you'd hurry up. But I've given you enough time. Don't make no demand on me. Because I ain't willing to sacrifice nothing for what you niggas is talking about. I'll go and sing, we shall overcome. Because King is dead now, he ain't asking me to march. I'll talk about Malcolm, beautiful Malcolm, rap on Malcolm. Just don't ask me by any means necessary, because I don't go for that. Go on, Elijah. Talk about them white folks. Build them schools and them hospitals and, the, and whatnot. I think you did a beautiful job reforming them junkies and whatnot, but stay around, away from around me. Just look at you, praising Marcus Garvey, but don't live the principles of Marcus Garvey. Praising noble Drew Ali, but don't follow the principles of that great man. Praising all of the saints that ever walked among us, that gave their life that we could be where we are, but we are not willing to give up our foolishness to live by the principles that made those men and women remembered in history. Beloved, I'm leaving. Be ye not conformed to this world. This world is run by men and women who have made a choice, Brother Lukman, and they've made a choice to consciously disobey God's will. This world has made a conscious choice. Listen to me good now. They've made a conscious choice 
to build their schools in rebellion to the will of God, to build their society in rebellion to the will of God, to build their world in rebellion to the will of God. They have made their conscious choice to go contrary to what the prophet laid down as principles of life. And this is why Elijah Muhammad called the white man a devil. No, 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 you don't understand the man. You helped crucify him because you didn't understand. You thought the man was out here trying to get you to hate white people. The man was trying to get you to see the principle that the white man built his world up off of. He built his world on rebellion to the will of God. He's a devil in practice. He's a devil in principle. And he has made you a devil in practice and a devil in principle. Little black devils who oppose your own good and your own salvation. Haters of self, killers of self. Can you deny this, beloved? I can't salute the American flag. You that want to do it, help yourself. But I can't do that. I can't teach my children to do that. But my God, man, my God, man, that's the flag of the country. Yes, but it don't represent God. And I'm not going to compromise. And that means I got to pay a price if I don't want to bend my knee to the wicked government powers of the world. Every man and woman who want to stand up knows that they have to pay a price. They must make a sacrifice for the redemption of others. I, I, I can't do that because I would partake of hypocrisy. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all? No. I can't do that. I can't do that, brother. Because I would be pledging my allegiance to a wicked lie. See, America knows how to talk good, but America don't live by what she teaches. She's a hypocrite from the very beginning. I can't lend myself to that. Jesus couldn't lend himself to the world. He said, I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. How many men will live the principle of Jesus Christ? How many men will live the principle of Muhammad? Then Jesus Christ lives and Muhammad lives and the prophets live and God will never be declared dead in human beings because when the principle is alive and active it is a redeeming principle it is a life-saving principle it is a principle of restoration of human beings to their proper and divine nature mm -hmm. I hope this is not too much for you conform to this world come on oh yeah see beloved look most of us have a superficial anointing of blackness you know blackness is something you wipe on you know like an anointment like Vicks have you know you rub it on your chest and in the morning where's the Vicks oh you got a little you know scent I think we did have some Vicks here. You wipe on Jesus Christ. You wipe on Islam. All of these are little garments that you put on to hide your nakedness 
and you're devoid, being devoid of real principle. So we put on the Islamic garment, dress up in long clothes, wear a bow tie and put a sun, moon, and star on our lapel. Christian wears cross. Everybody got their symbol. The Jews got his star of David. The brother got his dashiki, his juju beads and whatnot. Oh, boy, here we are. <laughs> She's like an ointment that you wiped on to cover being a nigger. And if we scratch just one, one scintilla of a centimeter, the nigger is right there ready to come out. <laughs> All this Jesus Christ, now listen to me good. All this Jesus Christ don't hide the nigger. Because when you scratch it a little, Jesus ain't even there. Scratch the surface, Muhammad ain't there. Scratch the surface, Nova Jew Ali ain't there. Scratch the surface, Garvey ain't there. Scratch the surface, Chaka ain't there. Scratch the surface, Hannibal ain't there. Scratch the surface, ain't nothing there but the same dead people with new bandages covering them as a shroud because they are unwilling to sacrifice their way of the grave to make a change in their life. Don't be conformed to this world. Anytime you a dope smoker, you conforming. What you mean, man? God put it there. No. See, that's the ointment. You wiping on yourself to cover your niggerness. God has never asked us to partake of anything that he created just because he created it. That's illogical. The Quran teaches us that he has created for us pure things and there are things that are impure and he forbids you the impure things and he encourages you to take the pure things. Is that correct? Well then why would you poison your body, poison your mind, stagger around, blast it completely out of your mind talking about this is what God did. You see how you try to justify your own craziness? You want to justify conforming to the white man saluting his flag, joining his army because, well, if, if America is attacked, we're all attacked. Who the hell say so? When God destroyed the people in the days of Noah, was not there an ark for the righteous to get out? When God destroyed the wicked in the days of Egypt, was not there a parting of the sea so that the righteous could get out? When God destroyed the faggots, and the homosexuals in Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't there a way for the righteous to get out? So don't tell me if the ship is torpedoed and you're on the back of the ship that that justifies you conforming to the ship's captain and his freakishness and his madness and his rebellion against the will of God, the sea does not necessarily swallow us all. What I'm saying tonight, beloved, is I want to challenge the hypocrisy of myself and yourself and all of us, this strange behavior that we keep lending ourselves to in these mass meetings, this strange behavior, you know, that makes us want to put ourselves over and against another group and another organization and another believer of another philosophy and we're all talking about solidarity and then here we go with vanity. One is trying to put himself over above all the others. But we see, we, we really say words, but we're like children that haven't caught up to the meaning of the principle that underlies these words. So I'm going to conclude now. Paul says, don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove 
that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, do you think we need renewing our minds? Well, then you must have conformed to the world. If you know our minds need to be renewed, it does. But now, look, transformed, transformed means, listen carefully now, that you make a change that the nature, the character, the attributes of your life are changed. And it actually has something to do with the word transfigure. That the figure of Christ would come across your personality. Not the figure of Christ's personality, but the figure of the principles upon which he lived his life. The figure of Muhammad, the principles upon which he lived his life. That must come across. And when that happens, there's a renewing of your mind and you become transformed. And that means you've made a sacrifice. You've given up the old in order to accept this new. And you've stepped out of the old into the new. You recognize that the old served its purpose and now it must give way to something better. I say to you, beloved, we've got to give up the old man of this old world order of rebellion to the will of God. We have got to walk out of this old carnal-minded self that follows after lust and urges of the flesh. I want that woman. She's fine. Oh, there's a husband. <clears throat> if I can get him out the way, I can get her. Or if I can get her out the way, I can get him. Or... Oh. Yeah, that's going on too. Look, if we want freedom, we've got to be willing to make a sacrifice. And the sacrifice starts not with somebody else, it starts right with you, you, you. You, there's something we're doing right now that's against freedom. Can you give it up? Can you give it up? Can you deny yourself? See this old phony self-righteousness of so-called religious people? That kind of hypocrisy, beloved, that has to be given up. My dear Muslim brothers, look. I want you to know as a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I love Prophet Muhammad. I honor and respect and revere him and this book that he brought to us. I may see it a little differently from some of you, but that doesn't mean I'm not a believer. Let us stop being judges of one another and leave judgment to Allah. Look, Muslim, don't wrap yourself in the book. Wrap yourself in the principles contained in the book. This Quran talks about a jackass carrying books. You put the book on the jackass's back, the jackass gets up the mountain, but it's still a jackass because he can't read. So now you and I don't want to be people wrapped in Islamic garb. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. looking holy but we're not living the principles of the book if you live the principles of this book beloved we are constantly at work freeing the slave we're constantly at work lifting up the orphan the man that's in the dust we work for his liberation we never side with the forces that destroy human life we oppose those forces and that's why Islam makes you a true revolutionary but by the same token, beloved Christian, I don't want you to grab your Bible.
putting people, the sign of the cross on people, and you ain't living it yourself? You don't want to be crucified? You don't want to give up a doggone thing for the gospel? You don't want to go to jail for the gospel? You don't want to suffer for the gospel? You don't want to go out and preach the gospel to the poor? You don't want to go in to the jails where the people are? You don't want to fight against a damnable Rizzo? You don't want to stand up against the forces of oppression? But you want to put the sign of the cross on people? This damnable hypocrisy has to stop. This, this, listen. <laughs> the ritual of Kwanzaa must be taken out of a ritual. Don't light the candle. Light your life with the principle. Don't wear the fez. Live the wisdom of the universe that you have on your head. Don't wear your dashiki. Live it. Be transformed. Be willing to give it up for the good of the whole. I conclude, beloved. I thank Allah for this opportunity to be with you. I'm grateful to see you moving together. Don't get up and leave. Uh-uh. Don't do that. Don't rush to the door just because I said I'm finished. I know you've been here long. Please don't do that. Beloved, I'm thankful to be here with you. I'm thankful for what I saw tonight. I'm thankful for what I heard. I believe that white folks know that they are in trouble. And the kind of thinking expressed here tonight makes me to know that repression is going to become heavy. But oh, I heard the story of Denmark Vesey and how his men were organizing one of his generals as they captured them. They were torturing them. And one man was willing to give in. He was about to break. And the general was laid on the floor, strapped down, and he ripped up his head and said to his brother, he said, Brother, die like a man. Die like a man. I thank God for this hour. I love black people. And I want to live my life to see us not compartmentalized, not fragmented, but a whole people again with harmony and love among us as a people. I want to live for that principle. And if it pleases God that my life be sacrificed for that principle, oh, I am so pleased to die for that because I know that I can never die anymore. They can never kill Louis Farrakhan. Not that they can't kill this body, but the principle that I'm living my life for. <laughs> oh, man. This principle would jump into the head and the heart of a little boy in here tonight. Some little girl somewhere. You can't kill this no more. Martin Luther King can't die. Malcolm can't die. Elijah can't die. None of these great men that live for principle, they can't die as long as the principle that they live for is alive in you and me. So let us not be cowardly in this hour. Whatever we have to face, let's face it, brothers and sisters. And let's not let others go do our fighting for us. Come on, let's present our own bodies as a living sacrifice. Here I am. I'm in the struggle. No sideline, brother and sister. There's not going to be no sideline. You're not going to watch Martin Luther King do it for you. Today, you're going to be called on to present your body as a living sacrifice for what you say you believe in. Can you dig it? All right. Then from this day on, Let's practice that love that Martin Luther King talked about, which I believe was directed in the wrong direction. Humbly speaking, I just don't believe you can love white folks into a change. Gandhi, if the picture, if you see the picture Gandhi, you may be inspired by Gandhi, 
But I think Gandhi also, though he was a magnificent man, he lacked the knowledge of the people because he never changed the British. Did you hear what I said? He forced the British to give up their position, but he never changed the British. They are still the same demons today that they were when Gandhi met them. That's the truth. So don't you let Gandhi's picture and uh, the marches of Dr. King mess your mind up for 1980s actions. No, I want you to listen. Martin Luther King didn't change white people. Did you hear what I said? Martin Luther King didn't change Bull Connor. White folk love to put... He reaped the whirlwind. Jesus said, you're killed by the sword. You lead into captivity as thou hast done. That's justice. Now you ain't bothering nobody. You peaceful and nonviolent. But if violence come and impose itself on you, if you turn the other cheek, that's the end of your cheek. You won't have no more cheek to turn. If violence come to our door, what else can we do? We cannot lay down and let our children die. We must fight with those who fight with us. That's the Quran's teaching. The Quran also teaches that in retaliation, there's life for you. Kill a, a slave for a slave. That's the Quran. That means what? If they kill us, all right, we go to your court. See if you're going to give us justice. You don't give us justice? Oh, we're going to get justice. No. No, no, this is no faggot era. Mm -mm. The, the day of faggots is over. See, I know the Quran says when you speak of fighting, you see their eyes get big. As though you looking at death. Because, see, you want to fight each other. But you have no stomach to fight your slave master and his children. You want to kill each other. You plan to kill each other, but you don't plan nothing scientifically. I know the government is in here listening, but I want them to listen. I'm not crazy. I know that God is with us yes, sir. if we are with each other. Yes, sir. And I'm not saying that we should do anything aggressive because the Quran teaches us and the Bible teaches us that Almighty God hates aggression. But he would hate you for being a coward in the face of aggression if you don't stand up like men and defend your wives and your children, your life and your community. Fight with those who fight with us. And if we die, it's all right. At least, at least I die like a man. And I know that I'm not yet dead. For I, Allah bought from me my life and my person and my property in exchange for the garden. So the Quran says they slay and they are slain. Come on, black man and woman. If we stand up like real men and women, we will never have to shed a lot of blood. Fragmented, we'll be dying. Little here, a little there, a little here, a little there. How long will it continue? 
when they see Christian and Muslim standing together, when they see nationalists and socialists and Christian and Muslim and Hebrew and NAACP and Urban League and SNCC and CORE and the AARPR and every other group or organization standing together, then they know that the end of their foolishness has come. Yes, it's either solidarity or death. Yes, Will you give up foolishness to accept solidarity? Yes, Will you give up folly and madness to accept right principles to live your life by that we can come into solidarity with each other on the basis of principle? Will you do that? Yes. Will we do it? Yes. Then let it be. May God bless you and keep you. May Almighty God make his face to shine upon you and lift up his countenance and spirit upon you and be gracious unto you and me. This is the day of our solidarity. Let us rejoice because God has made this day for you and for me. Thank you for listening. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Now, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, if you would just hold your places for one minute. Downstairs, there are about a thousand people downstairs. I would like to just go downstairs in the gymnasium and just give the greetings to the people downstairs. If you would allow me to do that before you flood out. And the speech that was made tonight is being duplicated right now on high-speed duplicator and you can get it on your way out if you're patient. And take it home and study it and pass it around to our friends and sit down and have discussions around it and then map out a program of self-sacrifice to give up the foolishness 